afternoon. This is Karen Hiskey with Space Labs Healthcare. Welcome to our webcast. Today's presenter is Dr. Brendan Smith, an anesthesiologist and intensive intensivist at Bathurst Base Hospital in New South Wales, Australia. Brendan is also a professor at Charles Sturt University. It's all yours, Brendan. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring and particularly its use in the rational use of fluids, inotropes, and vasopressors. Now, hemodynamics is generally considered to be uh, a very detailed and technical subject, which is a great shame because, in fact, it's remarkably simple. People think you're going to see lots of formulae like this. Um, obviously, you look at this and you think, ah, oh, come on, this looks more like rocket science than medicine. Well, you'd be absolutely right. These formulae are rocket science. You are not going to see anything like this in the next 40 minutes or so. Hemodynamics is most emphatically not rocket science. It's very simple physiology put into clinical practice. So let's get rid of these and move on to something a bit more interesting. When you were at high school, you probably did this simple experiment with a battery, an ammeter, a voltmeter, and a resistor. And when you hooked up the wires and measured the voltage and current, you proved Ohm's law, that the voltage across the resistor was proportional to the current times the resistance. The resistance could also be calculated from the voltage and the current. Easy. Well, there's an exact parallel in hemodynamics. But in this situation, we have a heart instead of a battery, the current flow is the cardiac output. Instead of a resistor, we have the vascular resistance. And the blood pressure is analogous to voltage. The science is therefore exactly the same. And that's really about as complex as hemodynamics gets. Now, there are a few basic laws we need to start with in hemodynamics. You learnt all of these in the first year at med school. Blood pressure is simply cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Systemic vascular resistance is therefore blood pressure over cardiac output, as we just saw. Cardiac output is the product of the stroke volume times the heart rate. Stroke volume is proportional to the preload and the inotropy. If preload goes up, or inotropy goes up, then stroke volume will also go up, and vice versa. Stroke volume is inversely proportional to the afterload. If the afterload on the heart increases, then stroke volume will tend to go down. Conversely, reducing afterload increases stroke volume. And finally, the most important formula in hemodynamics is oxygen delivery, DO2 which is the product of hemoglobin concentration times 1.34, which is the amount of oxygen that one gram of hemoglobin can carry, times cardiac output times oxygen saturation. OK, let's have a little look at how all these things fit together. Well, preload, inotropy, and afterload are the three determinants of stroke volume. Stroke volume combines with heart rate to give us cardiac output. Cardiac output, in turn, combines with systemic vascular resistance to give us blood pressure. But cardiac output also combines with oxygen saturation and hemoglobin concentration to give us oxygen delivery. And that's what we really want to know, because that's what keeps us alive. There's no point in having blood pressure if we don't have oxygen delivery. Now, all of these factors are indicated by the OSCON. Blood pressure, hemoglobin, we can measure very simply. So we can put this whole hemodynamic jigsaw together very quickly and very easily, and we can also do it non-invasively. Now, we often hear patients being admitted with shock. But what do we mean by shock? Well, perhaps the best definition 
is any hemodynamic disturbance leading to inadequate perfusion and oxygenation of the tissues. If there is sufficient oxygen delivery to the tissues, then there is adequate perfusion of the tissues. In other words, if you're receiving enough oxygen, it's a pretty safe bet that you're getting enough glucose and other metabolic substrates, and you're getting enough blood flow to remove the products of metabolism. Now, notice that definition of shock does not include blood pressure anywhere. Why not? Well, very simply, because blood pressure doesn't tell us anything about the heart's ability to deliver oxygen. And the only reason we have a heart and circulation, ultimately, is to deliver oxygen. And this is just a little visual reminder of what we're talking about. This is a slightly more graphic reminder. This little girl is a European baby. She's fair-haired, she's blonde, she's very fair-skinned. But as you can see, she'd hardly be described as being in the pink. And yet, her blood pressure is quite normal. But when we look, is this child shocked? Oh, there's absolutely no question that she is. In parts, she's critically ischemic. So the question I would ask you, is there anybody who doesn't want to know what her cardiac output and her DO2 might be? Let's go back to some very basic physiology you learned at first year med school. And this is the classic work by Starling, often also attributed to Frank, where they looked at ventricular filling, if you like, end diastolic volume, and how that related to stroke volume. And Starling in particular showed that there were several different curves that were possible. In the normal patient, the mild cardiac failure patient, and the severe cardiac failure patient. Now, if we load this ventricle at, let's say, one mil per kilo, then we have a stroke volume of 70 mils from our normal patient. Our heart failure patient, not quite so good, perhaps 45 mils, but our severe cardiac failure patient cannot manage 30 mils. So, let's increase preload. At 2 mils per kilo, our normal heart responds well with 110 mils. Even our mild failure can now maintain 70 mils, but our severe heart failure is still struggling at just 33 mils. Now, what's the fundamental difference between these curves? Well, as Starling showed, it's inotropy, or myocardial contractility, if you will. If we increase inotropy, we move from one curve to the other. That's very fundamental to what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. Let's increase the loading on this heart a little more, three mils per kilo. Now, the normal heart can actually stand that remarkably well and can still maintain a stroke volume of 80 mils. Our mild cardiac failure patient has dropped back to about 48 mils, but just look at our severe cardiac failure patient. They are now in big trouble at 25 mils. What we've got to do is optimize this preload and, if possible, get them to change trains onto a better curve. The problem, though, is how do we know which side of the Starling curve we're on? Are we underloaded? Are we overloaded? Well, what do we mean by that? Well, let's take a mild failure curve, and let's say that the preload is actually optimum. Well, in this situation, we would generate 70 mils stroke volume. But what if the stroke volume was somewhat lower? Is that because we're here and underloaded? Or is it here, because we're overloaded? The traditional medical method is to infuse volume rapidly into the patient and look to see if there's an improvement in hemodynamics. Well, if you're here, that's not a bad strategy. But what about if you're already here? The danger is that you can overload the patient further, and then we're in big trouble. Can we do a little